So one of the first things that I think we need to just cover off quickly is what on earth do we want from good worm control? We all talk about it, but what are the factors that are involved in that? And it will be that for some of you, some of these will be more important than others. Um, but, you know, good worm control, yes, we are wanting high lamb growth rates. Um, these are very important for efficiency um, all the way through the season. But the first question I would ask and make you perhaps reflect on is, do we know what growth rate we want or are actually achieving? Because as we talk through some of these things tonight, unless you're actually monitoring your, your lamb performance and have some benchmarks to compare with, it can be very difficult for you to know whether or not the changes you've made are making a difference, a positive difference. That's one of the issues that certainly within Scots um, we come across people not being able to measure improvement. You want to be cost effective, of course you do. And this again is one of the issues, historically, Antel Mintics have been cheap. And it's been really easy for us, and we were all brought up with this, to rely on them as the mainstay of our worm control pro programme. They are still very important, but I'm guessing that as you're on this webinar tonight, you realise that we're now looking at being having to really just rely on them a bit less and use them a bit more carefully. I guess you would also like it to be uncomplicated. And all of the stuff that we tend to talk about these days, people get quite worried that it is complex. It doesn't have to be that complicated. Yes, regular set worming patterns may seem easier on reflection, but what you've got to remember is that those set worming patterns weren't very often delivering the good worm control that you want, and they were certainly leading us down the road into being able to control worms less well in the future. And we want them to be sustainable in the long term, that sustainable word. And, and to do that, we have to try and reduce our reliance on antel mintics. But when we do use them, and we certainly do still need to use them, we need to make sure that that's as effectively as possible every time we do. So just one or two more, a couple more slides on land performance to start with, because again, I think you have to remember, and I have to remember when I'm dealing with my clients, that land performance is a multifactorial. There are loads of things that are going to affect it. I mean, looking at weather geography, I don't think anyone needs reminding how what an impact weather can have coming through the last few weeks that we've had to come through um, this so-called spring. You nutrition and body condition. Um, I, I've done webinars on this um, over this winter um, and we've done a lot of work on it. We know that's a huge influence. Pasture quality and quantity, massive influence on how lambs are going to perform. Genetics, of course. And then trace elements may well be a feature and then we get to health and we get to the fact that within that worms and the break that they have and the damage that they can do will also have an effect on land performance but I think it's important at this stage that we do just put things into perspective and um, because you do need to be really careful that you know you could spend a huge amount of time on doing faecal egg counts every two to three weeks and all doing everything right but if, for example, the pasture quality and quantity is nothing like as good, then you're not going to reach the performance levels that you want. So what growth rates do we want? Um, I've just got a couple of examples here, which are taken from the um, KPI project that we've been doing with AHDB. Um, and two critical times would be at eight weeks. And there, if we have, we're looking for 300 grams a day for an average um, commercial flock, we'd be wanting a weight of a lamb of about 20 kilos. And here's an example here of actually a flock of lambs that have been weighed, and we've got an average of 20.3, um, but given within that average, there's quite a variation. So my question to you would be, how do you measure up to that? Um, what are the real problems that are holding it back? And similarly, we can do the same. Um, the next one would be 90 days. I've put in brackets weaning because uh, obviously weaning time will change for people but you know they need to reach 30 kilos by 90 days if they're going to maintain that 300 grams a day and again having those benchmarks measuring against that means that we can actually begin to put to prioritize and to measure the impact of the changes that we make so 
Thinking about worm control then, the typical annual infection pattern that's going to be happening on our pastures. So this would be a pasture that carried sheep last year where we've got overwintered larvae. We've got some more infection dropped by ewes around lambing time. And then as the season progresses, we can see now we're into May, heading towards June. What's happening is our lambs are beginning to pick up worms. They too are dropping eggs and we're heading towards quite a big crescendo in the mid season in terms of um, infection levels on that, those pastures. And what we're really trying to do um, is to strike that balance, that compromise between the fact that we have to live with worms, but what can we do to minimise their impact in terms of the effect that they will have on our lambs? So we can try and reduce and or avoid the challenge. And I just want to cover that off first before we start talking about wormers and worming and anthelmintics, because as we said right at the beginning, one of the things we want to try and do is to reduce our reliance on wormers. So what are the sort of management strategies you could be thinking about? Clearly, we haven't got time to go into great detail tonight, but just to sort of put some ideas out there, and I'm sure there'll be some questions um, later on. Just before I do that, though, I just did just drop this little bit of video in because I think it's really also very pertinent. I was just saying to Catherine at the beginning that this year, you know, we are facing some massive challenges. These are really quite young lambs grazing away merrily. Um, they're picking up worms early. And this year, of course, the spring that we've had, they will have picked up worms and been forced to graze down at lower levels uh, at a very early age. So we need to be mindful of that uh, when we're looking at our worming programs. So what options have we got to reduce the challenge then? Well, the first one is to remember that the worms that affect cattle are not the same worm species that affect sheep. So if we alternate grazing with cattle, now the best way to do this would be to do it on an annual basis so that cattle graze a pasture one year and sheep graze the next. That would be the most effective way to do it. But clearly we could do it later in the season where cattle have grazed early and then sheep graze after that. Um, one of the questions I think that came in earlier on was about um, cross grazing cattle and sheep. And what some people often ask me is, well, what happens if we graze cattle and sheep together in the same field in a season? And the answer is that it would dilute the worm challenge. But your problem is that obviously managing the grazing itself is difficult because the sward height and the requirements for cattle and sheep are very different. So it does get complicated, although in theory it would reduce the worm challenge. We could think in terms of perhaps bioactive forages. I mean, you've got there um, a, a grass clover sward with some chicory in there. Uh, we know that there are um, a benefits to that in terms of worm challenge, and more and more people are actually going down that. And even um, swords with things like plantain, and although not noted for being bioactive, but it's also not so easy for the worms to climb up a plantain leaf and wave themselves in droplets of water to be eaten. So these sorts of things are beginning to make a difference to um, the challenge that's there for the labs. Other things we can think about, and there was a question came in um, ahead of the webinar about the work that the Clin breed is doing, for example, working really hard using a saliva test to identify um, breeding use, breeding lines, where there's a, a level of resistance in the animals. Now, it's not, I would prefer to call it immunity, it's animals with a really strong immune response that can deal with worms a lot better. And that is something which is going on actively in various breeds. Um, and that in the future is going to be quite a good tool for us to use. But in the shorter term, don't forget that because this so-called resistance in the ewes and, and the lambs is actually really their immune system, think about it being a strong immune response, then we also know, don't we, that nutri nutrition has a massive influence on how good an immune response our animals can mount. So I've shown ewes there. We know that ewes well-fed in late pregnancy, for example, really don't have as much of an egg output around lambing time as those that are um, less well-fed. But similarly with our lambs, if our lambs are on good pasture, they've got a good level of nutrition, they will develop their immunity much better and they will be able to mount that immune response um, much better um, to be able to stand up to the worms. 
So other things that we can use in terms of reducing the challenge or avoiding it, um, an example here, I'm just going to pop out now to our SCOPS website and should come up with, this is actually, this is live, so this is what the SCOPS website is showing today for um, the nematodirus um, forecast. So again, one of the things that we're trying to do here is to help you to better time your treatments, not lose lambs, not have to wait till you're losing lambs. It's quite difficult to do um, using fecal egg counts because with nematodirus this happened earlier than be earlier before we've got mature worms in there. So this forecast is quite useful. Um, have a look at it afterwards if you haven't been looking at, at it. But it's one way that we can improve um, and avoid the challenge unnecessarily. And the other thing is quite simple is that you know, from something like the matadirus, if you had lambs that carried, sorry, grazing that carried lambs last year, and you knew there was nematodirus there, you had to treat for it, then you know that they're going to be high risk this year. And trying to avoid some of those very high risk pastures, again, is a way that we can use our management tools rather than purely relying on antimintics to do the job for us. We can also think in terms of avoiding that horrible crescendo of challenge that comes in the mid season, round about the time when people are going to be starting to think about weaning. And of course, that's going to involve moving our lambs somewhere where there's a lower challenge. Now, that might be an area that's perhaps just carried some dry sheep earlier in the, in the season. So it's not going to be as bad as the pasture where the lambs and the ewes have been all season. But ideally, it's going to be something like this, which this is a, a red clover, white clover grass um, aftermath where silage has been taken off. Now the lambs have gone on there and it's not perfectly clean, but it's very, very low challenge. Or, as we've said before, you might just do the swap with where the cattle were earlier in the season. And another option would be to perhaps go with some um, spring sown some forage crops and actually wean lambs onto, the, onto there, which is what happened with these particular animals in Kent. They were weaned onto a forage crop and, um, and avoided the worm burden completely. So there are management things that we can do. And, and again, those two examples, of course, what we're also doing is providing those lambs with a very high quality, high level of nutrition, which is really important to try and keep those growth rates going. But the next question is, you know, how do we actually carry on with that? So we're looking at can we improve worm control and reduce reliance on antelmintics? So we've really covered this first one. Yes, we can reduce and avoid the challenge. So by using those management tricks, if you like, little tools that we've got in the box, we can begin to just beat some of the worst of it. But there's three other areas I just want to have a look at this evening um, that we also ought to be exploring. The first one is when, do, when we do treat, are we getting the best possible result from every treatment that we do? The second one is to uh, make sure that the product we've chosen is still fully effective. Is it still fully effective? Because if it isn't, we're not going to get the results that we want and we're also going to end up drenching more. And finally, what are some things that we can do to safeguard the future for worm control? So what are the things that we can be actively doing to try and reduce the, the um, risk that we're going to end up with um, really bad resistance on the farm? So just going back to this annual infection pa pattern again, then what we're trying to do with this is We've got our big crescendo there. We would like to try and avoid that using our management. But earlier in the season, the chances are that we're not going to be able to avoid the fact that we're going to have to control worms in lambs up to that point. So the first thing is, our first thing was, how do we make sure that when we do treat, we're getting absolutely the best bang for the bucks in terms of the product that we're using? And this is old stuff but it still doesn't get done and in a minute I'm going to show you just how wrong it can go. So the first thing we need to do if we're going to drench is we need to know how the, what the animals weigh and particularly what the top weight in the group is because that's the dose rate that we've got to choose and in this case I've just chosen a 5 ml 
um, for this particular group of lambs. I'm saying I want 41 to 50 kilos. Now, the first thing that, that goes wrong, of course, is that we don't get the weight right. And then what we find is that we go and pick the gun up out the corner of the shed, haven't used it since last year. Oh, well, it's a good gun. I paid quite a lot of money for it, or I only didn't use it much last year, and therefore it's going to be okay. And the chances are it isn't. So the next thing we need to do is to calibrate the gun. Um, you don't need anything fancy for this. I'm just using a big syringe here, thumb over the bottom. I need five mLs. I've set the gun for five, and I'm going to do four squirts in there, and I'm going to make jolly sure that having done four deliveries, I've actually got 20 mLs in that tube. And, and if you've not done this and you don't do it regularly, I think you'll be quite amazed a, how inaccurate dose guns are, and B, how quickly they become inaccurate. You've really got to check them. If you're doing a good number of lambs, you've got to check them as you go along. And then, of course, we want to deliver the dredge properly. We need to get that dredge over the back of the tongue. We can't afford to actually let it miss the rumen and go straight down into the abomasum because then it will not do the job. It won't stay in the system long enough to do the job to kill the worms. Now, I just had a little bit of a reckon up when I was putting this webinar together. And I thought, well, we know when we ask people to guess the weight of animals that 75% of us underestimate the weight. So if we underestimated and we reckoned that we were only our top weight was 40 kilos, less than 40 kilos rather than more than 40 kilos, and we put a 4 ml drench in instead of a 5, we're already only 80% of where we need to be. And then if we're really lucky and our gun's only 10% inaccurate, and, and that is not very inaccurate, you'll be amazed if you go and check your own, then we're down to 72%. And then if we've got poor technique and we're losing a bit, and you know, 15% down because we're not getting the technique right and we're actually drenching, maybe they're spitting a bit out or whatever, we can easily get down to not much more than 60% of the actual dose that that lamb should have received. And this is happening in a very, very high proportion of cases when drenches are being given. So we shouldn't underestimate the importance of this. And of course, one of the issues with that is that if that's what's happening, A, from my point of view, yes, that is encouraging resistance, but you're not getting the response to the worm that you're giving. You're not killing enough worms, and therefore your lambs aren't performing as well as they should do. So the other thing that we need to do when we're trying to make sure that the treatments that we give are effective is choose the right product. Just flip out again to the, to the website and just, you know, you can do that um, afterwards. You can get these um, off the website and just pick out the right product. Now, what is it you're actually treating for? We'll come back to this later on in context of, of, um, of inadvertent selection for resistance, but you've got them all there to be able to choose from. And the other one is, you know, aim to get the timing right. And this is where our fecal egg counting comes in. Um, and I will come back to this a little bit later on. But when we were just doing um, regular three to four weeks, irrespective, start on roughly the same week every year and keep going, a lot of those drenches may well have been unnecessary, but B, they can be, uh, have been mistimed. So what we're trying to do with fecal egg counting is to try and just get the timing better and avoid drenching when we really don't need to because perhaps the problem is one of those other issues that we said perhaps it's because of the ewes were in very poor condition the lambs aren't doing well very well etc now the other, next thing on my list was um, to make sure that the anthelmintic that we're using is actually effective is it actually doing its job how much resistance to that product is there on your farm and how much does that matter? So we've got our lamb on the left there. It's got quite a few worms in it. Green ones are susceptible. Red ones, two reds, mean that they are resistant to the wormer that's being used. So we take a sample. We work out what the egg count is to start with. We then drench. And then if it was fully effective, our lamb would have no worms left in it. But in this particular case, we've got um, some worms there which were double reds. They are resistant to the product that we used. They're still there. And those worms will be laying eggs willy-nilly, unaffected by the fact that we've drenched. 
So what we then do is go back and take another sample and check how many eggs are there. And because we can actually do that, we can look at the effectiveness and use a drench test. Excuse me, just let me go back to that. And use a drench test so that um, we get the interval right. We can actually decide how many of the worms are drench killed. And the intervals are there. So for, they're all 14 days apart from a yellow one, which is seven days. And the reason why those intervals is really important is that you're thinking about how long it takes um, for the lamb to eat some more, because as soon as he eats the next day, he's going to pick up infected larvae. We've got to test before those infected larvae become adults, but we need to make it leave it long enough so that we've killed everything out and we're only just picking up those resistant ones. So those timings are really important. And we need to make sure that anything that was left has matured and is laying eggs. So the problem, of course, is that most of the time, if it's only those three or four worms that are left, you won't notice it. It's insidious. So it creeps up on you. And when you're down at the bottom here, so when it's only killing about half of the worms, it's pretty obvious that things aren't going well. You've drenched them and they're still looking pretty mucky and still looking pretty grim. But when it's only a few, they can look perfectly normal. And it's only when you start to really get down into that red level that you really notice you've got a problem. And of course, all the time that you're leaving these animals with um, resistant worms inside them, you're building up um, the, the, the proportion, the population of resistant worms on the farm as well. So by testing, you could pick it up really early and we can then begin to put some of these other things in place so you don't end up down at the bottom end where basically there is no way back. Once you get there with the product, then you're not going to go back again. So making sure it's effective at an early stage, you win, you get better worm control, but also it's then encouraging us to be really careful and avoid going down the slippery slope. Now, some of the telltale signs um, are, and, and this, is, this is quite common, so you perhaps haven't done any testing and you're not sure, but you know, people finding it difficult to finish lambs, possibly, maybe too many stores left in the autumn. Maybe, and this is a very common one, you find that you really feel you're having to worm more often than you were. Why is that? Well, that could well be giving you a bit of a shove in the direction and um, that you need to, to have a look. Another one, a classic one, is buying lots of trace element drenches and boluses. I know I have this with my clients and groups that I work with. You know, it's, it's a classic one, isn't it? That's perhaps one of the first things we turn to when the lambs aren't doing very well. Um, and you've been drenching and you think your worm control is really good, um, but actually you've not really checked. OK, so the next thing, the final thing on our list, and number four, was to try and mitigate the effects of control strategy. So what are the little things that we can do here that when we are using antimintics, we can just try and future proof things? What do we need to be thinking about? Well, we've talked about the right product, the right dose rate, the right time. That will improve your results, reduce the need for retreatment. And for me, that's a win because it will slow the selection resistance for resistance in itself. One of the other things that we can do is to avoid dose and move um, and to avoid this really selective practice. So what happens is if we're going to put lambs onto low challenge, clean-ish pasture, we take them with a mixed worm population, we drench them, and then all we're doing is leaving them full of resistant worms, that is really going to be a problem. So the two options that we've got are we can delay the move. So we drench the lamb on the left and we leave it where it is for four or five days, picks up a nice little small mixed population of worms, or, or we can leave the best lambs undosed. So 10 to 20 percent, the top end lambs doing really well. They're doing really well. The chances are that they're dealing with the worms really well. We know that we can, we, the science proves that their immune systems beginning to deal with it. And therefore, they can take a very small population of mixed worms rather than just resistant worms. So that's a really classic one where historically um, it has caused a lot of problems with resistance. 
Now, one of the other things that we can do is to avoid what we call inadvertent use of antimintics. Now, what this is referring to is where we're looking at things like combination products and endecticides. And it's quite um, high on our agenda at the moment. Many of you will be aware that we now have, unfortunately, cases of resistance um, to sheep scab in the endecticides. But for a long while, we've been concerned about the fact that when we use a product for sheep scab, we're also worming that animal. So, you know, if you're going to do that for sheep scab, please make sure that it is sheep scab, that you do get a diagnosis and that you do actually use these products only when it's necessary because of the risk um, and, and the um, effect on resistance. And I'll come to combination products just in a minute. And another one would be the um, liver fluke. So if we're going to go for liver fluke, uh, then rather than use a combination product, which is a fluke and worm, there is very few cases where we would want to fluke and worm at the same time and get the, the results that we want. So we'd be looking for a narrow spectrum product. And we'll just flick back out to this again. And here you can see, if I just roll this down, here on the right hand side, we've got combinations. And these are things which are going to combine to do more than one parasite. And there are occasions when you might want to use them, but they're quite few and far between. So things like liver fluke, um, we would urge you to think in terms of using narrow spectrum products which target the liver fluke, but aren't also worming. And that's a selection pressure that we can do without. So just have a think about those before you actually use them. Now, one of the other things that we can do and we should be doing is to think about how we use, and this is for lambs this year, how we use the two newer groups, the two newest groups, the 4AD, the orange, and the 5SI, the purple drenches. And this is really important because we've had them around now for um, eight, six and eight years, um, eight years for the orange, six for the purple. And we're still not getting them integrated because there's still this attitude that we have to leave them on the shelf, you know, leave them till everything else is broken. And unfortunately, if we do that, we'll rely on them and we will break them pretty quickly. So we've got the three older groups. We know that we've got resistance to varying degrees on our farms to those. And we've talked about the fact that you need to know where you are on that. And we've got these two guys here. Um, how do we get the best out of them? Now, one of the obvious ones is to use them as a quarantine. Now, we're talking about lambs today, so I'm not going to get to drift off into quarantine now, but as quarantine drenches, obviously, they have a huge role to play. But what about our lambs? Many of you will have heard us talking about using these as a mid-late season drench. But what's that all about? Why would you want to do that? And I just want to quickly, and I hope quite clearly and graphically, show you why we want you to do that and only that at this stage. So we've got our lambs here, our two guys here again. Our lamb on the left has got a mixed population of worms in there. There's a little bit of resistance and we go in and we treat with a drench. This, in this case, it happens to be a white drench is in that particular gun, but it doesn't matter what it is. You might use one or two different of the different older classes, depending on where you are in the season and what you're trying to do. But there's a bit of resistance. So what's left, this is now imagine these are the same lamb. So when you've finished, there's a little bit, we drench again. And again, we add a little bit more to that population. And then we drench again. And so perhaps maybe by the mid late season, we've treated that lamb three times. And it's now building up quite a nice little population, all of its own, of resistant worms. And that's because worms live in lambs for several months. So it builds over time. And when we come in, when we come in with our orange or purple drench at that time, what we're doing is trying to kill all of these guys, taking them out because um, we, we haven't got resistance to those two groups there. We're trying to take them out. And the benefit of that is, first and foremost, to your lambs. If they've built up a population of resistant worms, then they're clearly not going to uh, be performing as well as they might. And secondly, from the point of view of resistance, we're wiping out those guys so that they're not um, producing eggs and adding to the population of worms. 
And it really is quite that simple. That is why we want you to leave it to the late, latter end of the season so we can actually get the um, double benefit of using that product. So, in summary then, and then I've just got a couple of things, a couple of slides um, to add to that, but just where have we got to so far? So, in terms of lambs, we want to avoid or reduce the worm challenge when possible. We now need to change that emphasis. It's not all about anthelmintics, they're still, still important, but we need to be thinking about how we can reduce it and avoid it. When we do use an antimintic, a wormer, we've got to make sure each treatment is as effective as possible. We've got to get the very best from each dose we use, and we're currently not in many, many cases. Choose your, choose your products carefully. Only use a combination if necessary, and if you're going to use an injectable for sheep's scab, then please get a diagnosis before you do. I'll be absolutely certain that that's what you need to use. Test the efficacy of the treatments. So you need to be looking at it regularly. Now, when you've tested, if when it comes back, you get a reduction of below 90%, then that suggests there might be an issue. That's when you get advice. That's when you talk to your veterinary advisor and you look at perhaps doing a more detailed test just to really establish what's going on. Use a group four or five product on lambs in the middle eight season, and that will help to really mitigate the effects of earlier treatments, and it will also boost your lamb performance because it's clearing out that backlog, if you like, of, of resistant worms that might have built up. And measure lamb performance against benchmarks. If you're going to do all of this, you need the comfort that you're making progress. And if you make progress, then hopefully that will encourage you to maybe take on board a bit more faecal egg counting, a bit more testing. I mean, we're all human. We all need to know that we're making progress. Now, just a couple of slides, because I know this will probably come up um, about faecal egg counting, because I haven't really banged on about that too much tonight. It is important. Um, and, you know, we've talked about using it to help time um, treatments properly but a couple of things I just want to say um, and one of them is to remember that when you're doing faecal egg counting you need to be doing it regularly it's not something that you can go in um, and just do the odd sample and expect that to give you really clear view of when you're actually going to drench because it, it really it, it need to be, need to build up a picture over time when you're doing drench tests that's okay they can be specific one-offs and that's a good place to start but if you're going to start using them to rely on when to tell you to drench you need to be committed to doing quite a few and using them as a monitoring tool second thing to remember is that looking at that life cycle when you are measuring those numbers of eggs in the dung you're measuring the a number of adult animals inside that animal and that's a reflection of how many infective larvae that animal ate three weeks ago, roughly. And so that's what you need to be looking at. So when you're interpreting things, you're not just thinking about it as a, that point in time. You have to be thinking a bit wider about the infection levels and what's going on. And also what those eggs mean for your lambs in three weeks time. OK, so it's a monitoring tool. Bear that in mind. And finally, when you're taking faecal egg count samples, please do take them. Take care. Be really careful because if you don't get them right, they're going to give you a really false result and lead you up the garden path. So one of one or two of the things just to say it must be representative of the group or mob. So what you can't do is to go around picking and choosing. So you can't go around saying, oh, well, I'll do a sample of all the um, good form pellets, which is the picture on the bottom there, or I'll only go and sample the lambs that are scouring because I think that's their wormy. That isn't how it works because there's other factors that would affect it. You must take fresh samples, and I've got gloves on there, and what I always do is just lay my gloved hand up against. If it's warm, I'll take it. If it isn't, I won't. And they must be at random, irrespective of whether they're hard, soft or whatever. If you're going to pull the sample, they must be equal sized. So I put a couple of spoons up there. The top one is just a medicine, kid's medicine spoon, whatever it is. Make sure they're the same size if you're going to put 
10 or more samples together and pool them um, because you don't want one animal influencing it more than another and then mix them thoroughly. So just a little bit there about faecal egg counting because I think sometimes people are doing them they're perhaps not being given the instructions and it's really important if you go to that trouble that it's as good a sample as you can possibly get. Okay, I think uh, we're, we're on our time there, Catherine, so um, I'm quite happy now to take um, some questions. Yeah, that's brilliant. Thank you, Leslie. Um, there's plenty of questions coming through, but I'll just take this opportunity to remind everybody that there's um, a few relevant resources available on the HTV website. Um, one of which is manual number eight, which is worm control in sheep for better returns. And then um, Leslie has shown on the screen a couple of times tonight, there is also our parasite control guide, which is a list of products for um, parasite control and has quite a lot on there, which might be of interest to some of you. Um, so Leslie, the first question I've got is, um, would you recommend that creep feeding lambs might reduce the egg output in them, similar to how well-fed ewes reduce their egg, egg output? Uh, that can work both ways. I think, yes, in terms of the fact that they are um, really well fed, they're on a, on a high level of nutrition. I, my, my experience with my creek feeding guys is that, yes, that does help. But what you've also got to bear in mind is that if you're really going hard at a creep feeding system, then really from a management point of view, you're trying to keep your sward height down. So what they are eating is likely to be quite low and therefore what they are eating might just be heavily concentrated with worms. So um, what I would say is, you know, do your monitoring. My experience would be that it would help, but I wouldn't want to bank on it. Okay. Um, just on the issue of co-grazing with cattle, does a leader follow a system help with that? Um, yes, it would do. Yes, it would do, definitely. Um, and again, though, it's just a question of, you know, um, how tight you can actually monitor that. Um, but, but yes, it would. Okay. Um, if grazing sheep in fields where horses have previously been, would that help to reduce the risk of worm burden? Yeah, yes, it would. Um, but again, I come back to grazing quality. Um, I'm not a ho I don't I'm not a horse hater, but they're not the best grazers in the world. <laughs> so um, you know, again, it would come down to you know what state of the horse has left it in, um, and obviously you know horses after sheep, that's not going to work because the horses aren't going to want to the sort of level of pasture that the sheep have left behind. But but yes, that would help, and it would also help the horses, I would guess too. Yeah. Okay. Um, can we mix our wormer with mineral drench? No, you certainly can't. Um, that is an absolute no-no. Um, and, and most of the packaging now, actually, we managed to get put on there. Thou shalt not mix this with anything else. So let's put it this way. Bucket chemistry is not allowed. Um, you know, we've talked tonight about um, getting the dose rate right and everything else. Um, as soon as we start mixing something else in, our chances of getting the dose rate right are even worse. And even worse than that, we don't know anything about whether or not there's any chemical reaction um, or um, flocculation settling out or whatever. So it's an absolute no-no. If you want to give a mineral drench at the same time, just have two bottles and two guns and give one squirt with one and then do the other one. But please don't mix them. OK, thank you. Um, I find sometimes some of the dose misses, so I tend to give another full dose. I assume this. I assume this potential overdose is better than an underdose. Would you? What would your advice be? Yeah, absolutely right. Um, I mean, most of these these products are tested to you know to um, be able to to be safe at very high levels. The only one that I would say you would have to be a little bit careful of would be a yellow drench. Uh, and the reason for that is that the yellow drenches work by paralyzing the worms very quickly. Um, and also, if you go more than more than double dose on those, sometimes you can see a bit of a sort of a neurological reaction in the in the in the sheep. So if you're using a yellow drench, take your time and try and avoid that. With the others, it's definitely the best policy. OK, thank you. Um, on using different wormers, I have been advised by my by my vet to speak leg count and then use white clear yellow orange and purple drenches in that order moving throughout the year if they're needed do you think that is a good strategy um i don't know the form it's not one that i would suggest 
Um, my mom, one of the reasons for that is, I mean, I mean, it, it's it. There's a lot, a lot going for it as well. I mean, obviously, with with white, what we're saying is we're still saying white for nematodirus. Um, but this year is proving to be quite a difficult year because of, for all the reasons people will know. And we've just issued um, a warning this this last week to say to people, look, the other worms are waking up. If you've got resistance to white, you need to change. Um, certainly ringing the changes is good. But I would say to them, I would think maybe the vet knows more about the resistance status on that farm than I do. And that's where that's coming from. But I would certainly not use an orange and a purple in the same year. Um, you use one or the other. And what I'm tending to say to my clients is we'll use one one year and one the next. Now, I know it's not been so easy to get hold of the purple drenches um, for the last year or two. But um, I think hopefully people will be able to get hold of those through their vet this time. So that's a bit of a pardon the pun, a bit of a woolly answer, um, but you know th there may be more going on in the background of that. But you you can't be prescriptive like that. I'm afraid we have to be a bit more reactive. Okay. Um, would it be good practice to use group four or five at weaning? Uh, yeah, I mean, weaning time is perhaps one of the obvious times to use it. That's mid-late season, and, and that is the time when many people would use them. It's a good time. The thing you've got to watch, though, is what I was saying earlier on, is that at weaning, you are in danger if you're not careful of doing a dose and move. So you need to be really careful that you use one of the two strategies I was talking about. Um, and, and certainly what I would say to people from a practical point of view is that to reduce the stress of weaning, I like to take the ewes away from the lambs and leave the lambs where they are for a few days just to reduce the stress on them. So you can actually then, when you take the ewes away, drench your lambs at that point and then you're leaving them where they are for a few days. So you're avoiding this horrid selection on dose and move. OK, um, and I think sort of similar to that, somebody's asked, if you're using a group four or five product with no recorded resistance, should we still avoid dose and move? Or do we want the lambs to repopulate with that on-farm worm population? Yeah, it's absolutely essential that we do avoid the dose and move um, pit because mm -hmm. you know, it, we, uh, although we say there's, there's no known resistance to these products, there will be some genetic material out there. It's inevitable that there are some worms out there that will have some um, genetic um, you know, resistance to them. So we really do have to work as hard as we can to avoid giving those any advantage and letting them have um, any free reign. So it's really important. Okay. Um, my lambs were born in February in Gloucestershire. They have had one worming of a white, but some are scouring. The big ones are 24 kilos already, but I want them gone as soon as possible. When would you advise that they're mid to late season when is the mid to late season to worm with an orange dose so that there will be time for them to grow before they are dispatched? Hmm. Um, OK, so they're February one. They've had a white wedge. I mean, if they're scouring now, I, I mean, I, the first thing is I would I would go in and um, do a faecal egg count on them. The chances are that they will find that what we've been finding in the last week or 10 days, that these worms are that the main worm species, if you like, around worms are starting to come to life now and that they need another drench. Um, but now's not the time to be going in with an orange or a purple. Um, I would choose one of the others, whether it's a yellow or whether it's a clear. Um, I don't mind. But when you've done that and um, following your faecal egg count, then go back in and check that they are working for you um, and take it from there. You really do want to be waiting until much later before you go in. You know, bear in mind what I was saying about, you know, several drenches and it building up in the animals. Um, now's not the time to be thinking about those. But, you know, when you do go in with the others, check, they, check they've worked. OK. Um, if resistance to older wormers is identified, is it possible to reduce the proportion of resistant worms by the use of the group four and five wormers? I had thought that once resistance to a particular wormer group was present, it was game over for that wormer. OK, well, it's probably difficult for people to think back. But if you think back to that little graph that I showed with the green and the, then the amber and the and the red zone at the bottom and the bottom lambs had really dirty bums and the other ones looked OK, but were in the orange zone. 
um, then what basically what the person's saying is right, once you get down into the red zone, there's no way back because basically more than half the worms are resistant, fully resistant, so they're breeding amongst themselves and there's not much we can do to uh, upset their party. But earlier on, um, no, we, we can't take it back up that hill, but what we can do is to, with, by using the group fours and fives, as I've described, we can just mitigate the effects of what we do in a season so we can almost stop the clock. And we can really slow it down to a very, very low level. So even if you found some resistance to the other three groups, A, it depends on how bad that is. B, it will vary from time of year to time of year. So if you find that your white drench isn't working in the um, spring, it may well be it's still working later on as the worm um, species change. So it's not game over. That's what I'm trying to say. So people will say, well, I've got triple resistance. You know, I can only use a purple or an orange. And actually, it's really, really very rare that even if you've got some resistance to all three, there aren't situations where we can use one or other or two or more of those for specific jobs and avoid having to rely on the other two. Um, so it's it's not that straightforward and it's not that the news isn't that bad. OK, thank you. Um, should the ewes also be given a late season drench of orange or purple when the lambs are done? Sorry, could you repeat that one, Catherine? Should the ewes also be given a late season drench of orange or purple when the lambs are done? Definitely not. No, we should we should not ever <laughs> be using those two products on ewes except as a quarantine drench or under really, really close veterinary um, supervision, you know, if there are uh, um, extenuating circumstances. And one of those might be where you've got really, really solidly resistant um, Himonchus contortus worm, for example, which some farms have, but that would be very specific. Never would we use um, these products as a routine on the use. Use don't need treating in the autumn, um, and the use hopefully haven't been treated all summer, so there's no reason why we would use this, um, you know, clean out approach, whereas our lambs have been treated several times, perhaps. Okay. Um... Would you do an egg count at the beginning to, tar to target, sorry, <laughs> would you do an egg count at the beginning to find out the type of worms you're trying to target rather than using a combination? Um, unfortunately, an egg count will only differentiate between the Matadirus and all the others. So an egg count will um, show you whether there's any Nematodirus there, um, but as we've said, that you know it's it's quite good to just confirm the anatodirus is there and you're looking at the other things but but actually by the time the anatodirus are laying eggs they've quite largely done their damage which is why we have the forecast for the other roundworm species then there are only two ways really that you can do it to find out what they are um, one is if you think you've got homonchus you can send it away to um, APHA and they will do a PNA stay peanut peanut um, stain on it and they can stain the eggs and tell you whether homonchus is there um, the other one is what you have to do is you to do um a, a larval hatch so you the lab takes them and they hatch the larvae and then they tell you what was actually there which is quite expensive um, so when you've got a resistance problem you certainly it's a good idea to find out what the worm species are but unfortunately it's not something that we can do um, with a regular normal faecal egg count <clears throat> okay, um, I've already wormed 175 lambs out of a batch of 250 using a white wormer. If my egg count comes back as they need worming, do I go in and do them all with a clear drench? <laughs> um, yeah, so, 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 what, okay, so you're going to do a faecal egg count now. So, um, yeah, I, unfortunately, that's what you would have to do if it comes back really high. Um, then you're going to have to go back and, and redo them. Yeah. Okay, if moving lambs onto totally clean forage lays in late summer, should you still avoid worming and moving? Sorry, repeat that one, Catherine. Moving onto forage forage lays. If moving lambs onto totally clean forage lays in late summer, should you still avoid uh, dosing and moving? Oh gosh, yes, absolutely. Because if you dose them and move them directly onto there, all you're doing is populating that that forage lay 
with totally resistant worms. And OK, you may say, well, I'm never I'm not going to go back there for quite a long time um, with sheep. But these worms, can, although we say they don't survive more than a year, they do. So it, it's never a good idea to do that. And um, will rotational grazing help to keep the worm burden down? Good question. Um, and it's one that um, we and uh, the parasitologists debate over over a beer whenever we get a chance. Um, the answer, the easy answer to that is no. Um, and one of the reasons for that is that although in theory you are providing the animals with better grazing and you're moving them on and they're not staying and you're going round and you're giving them fresh grazing as they go round rotationally. Um, so you might find that it's a help. And if you're monitoring, then you would know. But by the same token, depending on how the life cycle of the worms is going, um, and how long your rotation is, you could, can actually walk straight into a wall of problems because by the time you get back round to a paddock, what's happened is the, the eggs that were dropped last time they were there are all hatching at once. So, um, you know, those two scenarios are completely juxtaposed and it's impossible to know what's actually going on. So um, I would say on balance, because rotational grazing is so good in terms of, of, of lamb performance and also you know, getting, get, getting the most dry matter, um, I would do that, but I would be monitoring the worms very carefully because it can catch you out. Okay, thank you. Um, will yearling cattle mop up worms or does it have to be cows? No, yearling cattle will do it as well. Any cattle will mop them up, um, will mop up sheep worms, um, obviously, young cattle. Then it's a question as to whether or not you know there are they're their own worms are on there that are going to bother them. But no, any cattle will basically eat them with the grass that they eat because they can't live in those cattle. They will effectively knock them out. Okay, thank you. Um, if this if this year's lambs are on pasture not grazed by last year's lambs, but a faecal egg count of shearlings grazed there last summer showed a burden of 50 nematodirus eggs per gram, what is the risk in this year's lambs, i.e. should they be dosed and if so at what age? Um, there is going to be a risk but it's not a very high, high risk so I mean if you look at ewes through the year you can usually find some nematodirus in, you, in, in ewes as they go through, they, you know, they, they process it and there's a, a less than 50 eggs per gram. So it would be a much lower risk pasture um, I would then go on the basis of what do the lambs look like um, and possibly go in and just have a look at a faecal egg count and just see at this stage, because we've gone through quite a bit of the hatch now, um, then if it's going to be an issue, you should be able to see an egg count now. So, But it's going to be a relatively low risk situation. Okay. Um, we've been grazing our lambs on herbal lays for a couple of years now and have noticed a marked improvement in their performance, but obviously these lays are not cheap for us to establish. Do you know of any research quantifying the cost effectiveness of using herbal lays to reduce worm burden versus more conventional anthelm insects? I'm afraid I don't, no. Um, and, and it's always, you know, this cost effective data is, is difficult to come across. Um, I mean, there's also, a, you know, an issue with those in terms of you know, the nutritional value as well. Um, but, you know, the problem that we've got is that antimintics are still relatively cheap. Um, so the cost effectiveness for a lot of people ain't going to be that great in the short term. But in the long term, um, this person's going to benefit dramatically because they're going to be able to control worms really well for a long time to come because they're not relying on antimintics too much. So, you know, I think you have to convince yourself, you have to know what your growth rates are, compare them to benchmarks that other people are getting and, you know, be, be safe in the knowledge that the sort of performance that you're getting is going, it, it's certainly going to be cost effective. It's, it, it, it has to be. But, I, but I, I can't really think of any research that would be directly relevant to that. OK, thank you. Um, is there any problems with worming and vaccinating with um, ovivac or hepstack at the same time with regards to the lamb's immune system? No, none at all. None at all. No, no. OK. Um, can you introduce non-resistant worms into a pasture where you know it is infected with resistant worms? 
in theory you can in parts of south africa that's what they've been reduced to and these are cattle worms because they had such horrendous resistance problems they ended up not being able to graze them on vast areas so they stuffed cattle full of, of susceptible worms and put them out there in the hope that it would happen my understanding is it wasn't desperately successful so it's not a strategy that i would say is something that we could rely on even though in theory it might be possible once you've got um, a really solidly resistant population you can stuff animals full but you've got to bear in mind that the vast majority of the worms are on the pasture at any one time so anything the animals are con contributing um, is not that great in terms of proportion so um, in theory, yes. In practice, mm, don't think it's probably going to be practical. Okay. Um, how regularly should anthel mintics be changed? For example, if lambs are dosed two or three times in their first season, should different products be used or the same product and then a different one on next year's lambs? Um, no strict rules on that now. I think if you are checking that the anthel mint that you are using is working, there's no reason why you shouldn't use it two or three times um, in the same season, providing you then clear clear the job up by using a, a, an orange or a purple drench as we've described. Now, you know, historically we were told that what we need to do is to use one drench one year for the whole year and then another drench type another group for a whole year now that's we no longer recommend that because what you will tend to find is that there will be differing levels of resistance at different times of year so most people perhaps use a white drench for nematodirus to start with and then they will swap over to either a yellow or a clear and they may well then stay with those until they come in with the group four or five um, but th there's no hard and fast rules on that the main thing is for whatever you are using check it's working properly and then mitigate the effects of it with your mid, mid to late season drench okay um could you please just explain the importance of getting the worm over the tongue and the consequences of not doing so okay i mean basically even in adult sheep but but um what you've got if you all remember your calf rearing um that we were all taught you've got what we call the esophageal groove so when you've got a young ruminant they have what we call an esophageal groove which snaps shut when milk goes into and the liquid goes into the mouth and that means that we don't get milk in the undeveloped rumen which would obviously cause all sorts of problems as they get older then that stops and obviously they're not taking in liquid to the same extent anyway um, and then we get food going into the rumen the problem we've got with wormers is if we fill the mouth um, with a wormer liquid then what can happen is the esophageal groove can still snap shut and then the wormer bypasses the room and goes straight down into the lower gut and we're not getting the effect that we need so it's really important that we get that nozzle over the back of the tongue but we do it carefully so we don't go through the back of the throat um, and just to avoid the chance that that esophageal groove can snap shut on us thank you um, what is your advice on when to seek a leg count in ewes and when, how would you interpret the results if they had the same results as the lambs? Would you still worm the ewes? No, no. Um, I mean, at this stage of the year, um, I mean, the ewes have had a rough time, but most of them now will be regaining their immunity. So, um, you know, if you want to, you can, I mean, I've done quite a lot of monitoring ewes through pre and post lambing and you know they do regain their immunity quite quickly um, and they certainly don't need drenching when we're drenching ewes what we have to remember is that other than anything that's really lean or if we've got homonchus most of the time what we're doing with ewes is thinking in terms of trying trying to reduce some of the burden some of the um, infection levels that are going out on the pasture it's not for the ewes themselves um, when i would do um, some faecal egg counts on ewes um, just to convince myself is that um, in the later in the season pre-topping a lot of people have now gone away from treating pre-topping which is brilliant we don't need to but if you're still unhappy about that then I would suggest that you do some faecal egg counts just to prove to yourself that those ewes at that time of the year really don't have anything much in the way of a worm burden and they really don't need treating. Okay. Uh, when I take my samples to the vet for faecal egg counts, they always come back negative, but the ewes are scouring. Do you have any advice on what this could be? 
uh, <clears throat> well, it could be all sorts of things. Excuse me, sorry, glass of water. Um, <clears throat> if they use a silk scour, it sounds as though it's more of a nutritional scour. I mean, they may be on a lush pasture. Maybe there's quite a lot of nitrogen kicking around there and um, going through them. You know, ewes that are working really hard, um, lactating really hard, they will tend to be a bit loose. I mean, think about dairy cows that are working really hard um, on high quality diets. They would also be loose. Um, you've got to be a little bit careful, though. And this is why I was saying about the faecal egg counts that you have to interpret them slightly differently because if an animal is scouring and it's scouring through the eye of a needle, then if you can imagine, um, the worm eggs are coming out really quickly as well. So it tends to dilute what's really happening because you're going to getting a, a lot of um, a scour coming through and you've got a lot of quick passage. Whereas if you've got really tight pellets, it's slow and it concentrates them more. Um, but it's more likely to be a nutritional scour. Okay, thank you. Um, is there any disadvantages of using a group four wormer as the first wormer for lambs other than cost? Um, well, they're just, well, obviously there's a disadvantage of cost, but I would say that the main disadvantage is that you're using it unnecessarily. Um, what we don't, what we want is for people to use these wormers, but when we use them, we want as much, uh, much out of them as possible. So using it as the first wormer is not doing anything about what we're talking about later in the season, which is on, you know, mitigating um, the selection that we've done with other wormers. So I would um, suggest thinking long and hard um, before you use a group four or a group five early in the season. Do you really need to do that? And if you don't need to do that, then save that wormer for later on. Okay. Um... Is it not a good idea to plan to give a small overdose of, of wormer to make sure that you're producing stronger resistant worms? No, they're either, they're either resistant. I mean, we, we say that <clears throat> they're resistant to the, to the normal dose. Um, I mean, it's a good idea to make sure you give at least the, um, the dose that's required, which is why we say dose to the heaviest lamb in the group. So obviously some of the lambs lower down the group are going to get um, a slightly higher dose. Um, but what we don't want to be doing, I mean, it, it is a strategy that maybe with a vet um, where we're running up against resistance problems, they might consider. Um, but at the, at the moment, I would say, no, that's that's not something that we should really be doing as a regular thing. We just need to get the dose rate right. Okay. Um, do you have any thoughts on long-acting wormers for PPR reduction? Um, yeah, I do. Um, I mean, I think, you know, obviously that's where people have looked to using them um, in use at, at lambing time to try and reduce this periparturian rise. Remember, we looked at that graph with the U egg output. Um, now, there are two or three things there. One is that we would always advise that if you're going to do that, try and leave at least 20% of the ewes undrenched because obviously there is a really a sustained selection pressure going to be going on um, from that point of view. And some work which has just been published recently and which we in SCOPS have actually um, gone out to the press with as well, suggests that you know what's really happening now is that only those ewes, only the really the poorest, youngest ewes are actually contributing a significant amount to that periparturient rise anyway. So I kind of turn it round on its head now and say, if you're going to drench any ewes or treat any ewes at lambing, it needs to be a smaller rather than a greater proportion because the overwintered larvae are still there. And, and we've got to be really careful because, um, you know, the, the persistency on um, moxidectin the long-acting wormers, it's not persistent against Matadirus and it's not persistent against Trichostrongolus um, and they don't have the same degree of persistence against Homonchus. So it's only against Telodosagia and you've just got to be really careful, um, you know, that, that we use it carefully and we're not sort of thinking it's going to cure everything um, because it's not. Okay, thank you. Um, does reseeding a field in, or ploughing a field in the autumn, produce clean nematodirus grazing for the following spring, despite being grazed in consecutive years by lamb? It will be a lot better, but I would not to deem it as clean because these worms are pretty clever and there will still be some around. 
Um, but it will be obviously from a point of view of risk level, it would, I would say, would be a low risk, but I certainly wouldn't say it was no risk. Okay, um, and then last question, I think we'll have to wrap up in the interest of time. Um, what age would you start looking to worm lambs for their first dose in an April lambing flock? Um, very much depends on level of challenge and so on. But generally speaking, you would be looking at, and I wouldn't say looking at going in and worming them at six weeks, but I would say you'd be looking and going in and taking the first faecal egg count sample from them at around about five or six weeks of age to see where you were. Okay, great.